We're going to jump right in here in the book of James, and uh, uh, the author of this book is actually uh, the brother of Jesus. James is the brother of Jesus. He received the nickname uh, James the Just, or he was known as James the Righteous One. Can you imagine being the brother of Jesus and being called the Righteous One? This dude had to be a pretty good dude for him to get the nickname the righteous one when he was the brother of Jesus. You know, and, uh, and we, we see that by uh, 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 Mary uh, conceived of the Holy Spirit and birthed Jesus, but later on she was married to Joseph, and they had mo- many kids together, uh, boys and girls that are referenced multiple times in scriptures. One of them is this man, uh, James. And, uh, and it's, it's pretty amazing. He kind of comes out of nowhere in the, in the book of Acts. You don't hear too much about him up until he becomes a prominent figure in the early church. He was highly respected by everyone that knew him. That included all of the people that disagreed with him, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, all seven different sects of Judaism, uh, all highly respected James, and they called him James the Just which is pretty incredible that as they were killing Christians and persecuting them, they all acknowledged, but this one is special. Which is pretty amazing that his reputation was so profound. I, I'm excited to talk to you about him today because um, many of you have never heard about James the Just. And there's a couple different James in scriptures, and sometimes it's, it's difficult to get, keep them all straight. One is James, the brother of John, the sons of Zebedee. He was one of the apostles. Another was known as James the Lesser. He was one of the 12 disciples named James the Lesser. Can you imagine having the nickname the Lesser? You know, it's like there's that guy, then there's that guy, uh, James the Lesser. No, it actually means James the second. Some people believe uh, he was uh, the same as James, the brother of Jesus, but the more you read into scripture and history, it really actually seems like there are three distinct James, which would have, it's a variation of the name Jacob, which is very, you know, a very famous name that there would have been many of in that time. Three distinct James in the early church. One of them who we're going to speak of today is James probably the oldest brother, but the brother of Jesus. And he writes this book to us in his letter. And I want to read the first verse and the last verse of his book to kind of set up where we're going to be going over the next few weeks and, uh, and give some context to what we're going to learn from James, the pastor uh, of the Jerusalem church. He says this, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't you think it's amazing? The title he chose was actually his greatest title. He could have said James, the brother of the Lord, the bishop of the church of Jerusalem. But he says there's a title even greater than that. It's to be a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me tell you, you're in a place where you are surrounded by servant leaders, servants of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's no small thing. It's no little thing to serve God. It's the greatest calling in humanity. And you might never be a pastor. You might never be a pope or a bishop, but you can still be a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's the highest calling of mankind. And he writes to the 12 tribes in the dispersion, and he says greetings. What that means is he's writing to the Jewish Christians that were dispersed. See, what happened in Acts chapter 6 was there was persecution that hit the church, and they actually grabbed a man named Stephen, who was over their, their care ministry of the church, and they accused him in the Sanhedrin, and they murdered him in Acts chapter 6. He was the first martyr for Jesus Christ, and after that, a wave of persecution persecution hit the church, which was led by a man named Saul. They actually went door to door, searching room to room for people that called Jesus Christ their Lord and their Savior. And there's a time where the persecution became so profound by Saul that people began to flee all over the world. And here's what's so amazing is God used even that persecution to spread the gospel all over the world. How powerful is that? And now Saul, and we're going to talk about him a little bit later, but Saul thinks that he's chasing them down by going to another great city called Damascus, but it was on the road to Damascus as he's going to persecute the people that are bringing the gospel there that Jesus stops Saul in his tracks. It's powerful. These are the people that James is writing to. The pastor of Jerusalem is writing to all of those that had to flee his church because of the trials and the persecutions that they faced. Let me read to you the end of this book, James chapter 5. He, he talks about many different subjects, but he ends on the subject of prayer. He says this, Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. 
Is any among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. Yeah, let me tell you, you need a crew. You need some people that will pray for you when you need help and will cheer for you when you're going through something good. Because I know in this church right now, there are some of you that are suffering and some of you that are cheerful. But under this same roof, there is that God is enough for both the cheerful and the suffering. And he says, the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick and the Lord will raise him up. The Lord will raise him up either on, the, on this earth or in heaven, but make no mistake, you will be raised up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins. Don't hide your sins. Don't be nervous about it. Don't be overly ashamed. No, confess your sins. Get it out in the open. Get it out in the open and then pray for one another. Don't judge one another's sins. He said, what? You went where? You what? Who? No, confess openly, pray openly, encourage openly. Come on, believe openly. Come on, that moment doesn't define you. God's gonna raise you up. Amen? Look at this. Look at this, that you might be healed because here's the reality. Sin sears the soul, but confession and prayer begins to heal the soul. And then he says this famous phrase, I'm sure you've heard it, the prayer of a righteous person. Another translation says the prayer of a just person has great power as it is working. Uh, the King James says this, it, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much, produces much. The prayer of a righteous man, the prayer of a just man. James' nickname was James the Just or James the Righteous. And so he's telling you, not out of a theory, but out of a life he's lived. When you begin to pray, and you begin to pray fervently, and your life begins to come into alignment with God, it begins to do very powerful things that you could never do on your own. Hey, let's pray real quick together. God, I pray that you anoint these next few moments, and, and God, I pray that you bind us all together, that we might, we might hear from, from James and, and, and hear what you would speak through him. And God, I pray that awakening it's never the same this week, the next week, even through the summer. I thank you that 915 is awesome. I thank you that 11 is blessed. We pray for 12 o'clock in Providence. May it be filled with families that are coming to know you. In Jesus' name, all God's people said, amen. 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 Hey, what, what is it that would cause the brother of Jesus to believe that he's God? What, what kind of an event could cause someone to think that their brother is God. How many people here have a brother? How many people believe he's God? Your brother can't even believe you're in church. Your brother doesn't even believe you're, you're actually attending on Sunday, never mind. He doesn't even believe you know God, never mind you are God. A brother is God. You gotta understand the, the personal of this. This is no small thing. This is incredible. James grew up with Jesus, and in the end, he believes that the one I grew up with played in the backyard. I don't know what else I did. <laughs> I'm trying to come up with stuff, but I don't know. It's not in the Bible. Wrestled, you know, I don't know. What do brothers do? I'm thinking of my, my sons. Fought over toys. The, the, that this person's God. I would believe that Mary thinks Jesus is God. For one, an angel came to Mary. For the other reason is a lot of moms think their kids are God, you know? <laughs> Dealt with a lot of moms in my youth group days. They all think their kids are special, but supernatural, close to Jesus. And uh, so I, I get it from Mary, but, but the brother, that, that's pretty unbelievable. In fact, I think it's one of the, I think it's like one of the greatest witnesses to the resurrection is the fact that James said something happened. I think he's one of the greatest witnesses to Jesus that his own family said, this is for real. This is for real. And, and, and he didn't say it for just a little bit of time. He said it throughout his entire life. This is for real. It, it just proves that there's something supernatural about Jesus. You know, there's just something so powerful about who Jesus is. And I, I wonder what it was like. Can you imagine, can you imagine if your older brother was God? Like, you want to talk about the craziest middle, middle child syndrome in the world. Like, what was James, what, what must he have dealt with where Jesus is actually perfect in all of his ways? You know what I'm saying? Like, that must have been tough. 
Like Mary's got to balance this thing out, but one of them is God in the flesh and the other is just some kid, some, some 13-year-old kid. If I was James, though, I, I would hold the fact that Mary and Joseph forgot Jesus at church, I would hold that over Jesus' head for his whole life. That's all I got, you know? Did you know that? That Mary and Joseph forgot Jesus at church? And do you know they forgot him for three days? Can you imagine? When I read that as a parent, I'm like, man, what freedom did those guys enjoy to just forget their kids for three days? What culture was this? Like, I wonder if it's because he was God. Mary's like, ah, he's fine. He'll find his way home. He'll walk on water or something, fly. I don't know. He'll, he'll be good. They went, they went home, and for three days, they were just partying on their way home, didn't even realize that Jesus was gone. When they get home, they're like, have you seen, have you seen Jesus around? And James is like, nope. You know, he didn't say a word the whole ride. <laughs> he, he, was, he was enjoying all the quality time. He's finally getting noticed, you know, the perfect Jesus, you know. <laughs> then they go back and they find Jesus and Jesus is in the temple and he's just like destroying people through debate at 12 years old, which I love that, you know. I kind of relate to Jesus because my parents used to forget me at church all the time. Not once, not twice, all the time. It happened multiple times. And I remember them all vividly, you know, because you remember trauma, I guess. But I remember the times vividly, you know, and my mom would come back and, and they would always try and pretend like they didn't forget me. Where were you? Like, where was I? I'm not the responsible one in this party. Where were you? I can't drive a car. You drove that white minivan off. Where was I? I watched through the glass one single tear. Where was I? Right here. <laughs> and back then there was no cell phones, you know, so they'd have to get all the way home. They'd get, listen to the voice messages preparing mac and cheese, and I'm at church, you know. One time I asked my mom, why did you forget me so many times at church? And my mom's like, you know, it was the 90s, you know, and, you know, there was revival, and the Holy Spirit was just slaying people. People were, like, falling under the presence of God, and church was, like, eight hours long, and, you know, you just got lost in the mix, you know. And I'm like, did you just blame the Holy Spirit? on forgetting me at church? <laughs> Just play the God card on this? <laughs> they forgot Jesus, you know? But, but I, wonder, I wonder what it would have been like for James growing up where Jesus is obviously Jesus and, and you're just one of the crew. You're just one of the brothers and, and Jesus also had sisters. And, and you know what's interesting about James is do you know that he didn't believe at first? There's actually multiple instances where all of the people around Jesus didn't believe that there was something special about him, or at least certainly that he wasn't the promised Messiah. All of the people closest to Jesus, get this, missed him. Isn't that amazing? In fact, the first time that we see that happen is Jesus reads the scroll of Isaiah, says I, I, the prophecy about the Messiah that I've come to set the captives free, and Jesus says, today this prophecy has been fulfilled in your midst. And people were so enraged by that sermon, they grabbed Jesus and they tried to throw him off a cliff. No matter how bad I preach, I'm thankful nobody's tried to throw me off a cliff yet. We're on flat ground. Isn't that an unbelievable reaction? Minute one, sermon one, they try and kill him. It was always Jesus' destiny to be killed. The first sermon he ever preached, they tried to kill him over. And then another time when Jesus comes to Nazareth, he tries to do some miracles. And the Bible actually says he was unable to do any miracles there because of their unbelief. Listen, belief is powerful, but so is unbelief. Your unbelief is very powerful. Your doubting is very powerful. Your faithlessness is very powerful. It can literally cause God to not do any miracles. It's not that God couldn't have done it. It's the fact that God set some principles for himself saying, I'm not gonna do this all on my own. All I need though is a little tiny bit of faith the size of a mustard seed. Then we can move mountains together, but you gotta believe. And they said, no, no, we, we, not, only, we not only don't believe, we know who you are. They said, aren't you the son of Mary and Joseph? We, got, we know your brothers. There's James and Simon. We know your sisters. Who do you think you are? And the Bible says they were offended at Jesus. And make no mistake, for 2,000 years, people have been offended at Jesus. He never stopped offending people because he was who he was, and you have to make the decision whether you will accept him or not. 
We find later on that Jesus is in the temple in Capernaum and he heals someone with the withered hand and he does it on the Sabbath. That's a big no-no because you're not supposed to work on the Sabbath. And apparently healing is work. It seems like it's God's work, but it was work. And all of the, um, the, the Pharisees, they become enraged by this and they're frustrated. They're saying, how are you working on, on the Sabbath day? And then he casts out a demon and they say, you can only cast out demons because you're the son of a demon. And they, they literally call Jesus the son of Satan. Son of Satan. And, and the family of Jesus, realizing that this is about to get out of hand, that usually the next step when the Pharisees start doing this is that they kill this person. They realize that they're gonna kill Jesus. They show up in Capernaum and, and the Bible says that his mother and his brothers and his sisters, so I would assume James was a part of this, showed up to take charge of him because they thought he had gone insane. Isn't that unbelievable? That his own mother, who had an angel appear to him, had a moment where she says he might be losing his mind right now. And his brothers and his sisters say, this has gone way, way too far. I think he's lost his mind. And in that time when things like that would happen, it was your family that would come and constrain you. So they showed up to sit Jesus down and, and chill him out for a while. One, to rescue him, but also because they themselves, they, they didn't believe. They, they weren't sure of what's happening. So they thought, Jesus must be insane. And, and the Bible says that they came in to come and get him, but there were so many people crowded around him, they couldn't get to him. And so they send a messenger in and, um, and they say, hey, your mom, your mom is looking for you. And this reminds me of the 90s as well. People are always looking for me. My mom always wanted me to come to the altar to have someone pray over me every single Sunday. So I became, I became like a ninja at hiding from my mother's messengers, you know? And, and so Mary sends a messenger and she says, hey, your mom's looking for you. And Jesus knew they're coming to take me away because they think I'm crazy. And Jesus says, see, my mother, uh, my brothers and my, and my sisters are ones that hear my words and they obey he says, it's my followers that are my family, which this is pretty incredible to us because you would think that, no, family above everything, but Jesus is saying, no, no, I'm not just here for my physical family. I'm here to turn those that had no connection with me into my brothers and my sisters. Jesus is welcoming you as a follower into his family. It's so powerful. And later on, Later on, Jesus' brothers come to him and they say, Jesus, you're here in Galilee. This is the middle of nowhere. And, and you're doing all of these works. Why don't you go to Judea, Jerusalem, and why don't you do those powerful miracles there? And then everyone will believe you. It's like his brothers are giving him good marketing advice. Like, why don't you just go there, do a couple miracles, and you'll be world famous. They said, show yourself to the world. Don't do it in this tiny little place. But the Bible says in the next verse, John chapter 7, is that they actually, they were doing this because they didn't believe. His brothers came to him, and what they were trying to say is, will you leave? Will you get out of here? Will you go, like, somewhere else? Because we're embarrassed. This, this, is, this is too much. Just go to where your disciples are, because we're not them. Their brothers themselves didn't believe in Jesus. So we see this pattern all the way from the beginning of the brothers saying, this ain't it. He's not the one. But something happened that changed their opinion about Jesus. Something powerful, something huge, something catastrophic, something gigantic changed their opinion of Jesus. Listen, I'm here to tell you today that it's an encounter with the resurrected Savior that changes everything. It's an encounter with the resurrected Christ that's what changes. Before the resurrection, there was unbelief. They were calling him insane. They were all weird about it. But after he resurrected, Paul tells us that Jesus first shows up to Peter, which is so powerful because Peter's the one to betray him, and Peter's the, one, the first person he shows up to. And then he shows up to the other 12 disciples. And then he shows up to 500 people. And Paul, at this time of writing, says many of them are still alive and are among us. But then he writes this very powerful phrase, then Jesus showed up to James. The resurrected Savior showed up to his half-brother. See, James was there. He heard the lessons. He heard the stories. He heard the Sermon on the Mount. He, he saw Jesus die, but it's when Jesus conquered death, conquered sin, conquered
conquered shame, conquered the grave, left the cross empty, and walked out of his own grave. He appeared to James, and James said, this I can't deny. This is something real. This is something powerful. And it was such a supernatural event that James went from thinking Jesus was crazy to thinking Jesus is God. He's the Messiah. He's the Savior. He's the one that we've been waiting for. It's real. What a powerful event. Let me tell you, you need to encounter, you need to encounter a risen Savior. You need to encounter Jesus. James heard all of the sermons. He even saw the miracles, but those weren't the things that changed him. What changed him was an encounter with the resurrected Savior. I'm here to tell you, listen, it's not your church-going attendance that saves you. Though, of course, you should go to church more. It's not, your, it's not my sermons that will save you. It's not your friendships or your family that will save you. You could be family to Jesus and still be familiar with him and miss what he came to do. Never mistake the power of familiarity. Familiarity always breeds a lack of faith. Because whatever, I've seen it before, it's no big deal. I'll tell you, some, some miracles that happen in our own house, we might miss because we're overly familiar with the people in the house. Oh, God always does that, it's no big deal. We, sometimes we got faith that God can do it in Africa. He could do it in Australia. He could do it with those faithful people over there in Jerusalem. But here, I don't know. Just a little old me. That's what his brothers were saying. Go to Jerusalem. Go to your disciples. They've got faith. But here, it's too small. I believe that God loves the small places. I believe that God loves normal people. I believe that he's got something special in store for us. I don't want to have familiarity crush my faith. I want to have a unique powerful encounter with the risen Savior. I want to get my expectation up. I want to get my faith up. I want to believe again. My question is, have you had that encounter? Because it changes everything. Paul's writing this. He says he met James, and then he met all the other apostles, and finally Paul says, I met him. And I met him on the road to Damascus, and he says, I'm the least of all the disciples. He says, I don't even deserve to be called an apostle because I actually persecuted the church. He says, but now I am what I am by the grace of God. I'm an apostle just because of his grace. I'm a teacher just because of his mercy. And any good I've done is only because of God. See, Saul was riding on that road to Damascus to go kill Christians, but Jesus showed up and revealed himself to him. He had an encounter with the risen Savior, and it changed Saul to Paul. It changed a persecutor to an apostle. And Saul's saying, James had that experience too. He had that encounter as well. I guess what I'm trying to say to you, church, is you have to have an encounter with the risen Savior of Jesus. I don't care if you grew up in church, if you know the catechism, if you went to youth group all your life, those things don't save us. Even our good works, they don't save us. Even our good works must be a consequence of our faith. And how do you get faith unless you've had an experience? something undeniable, something so real, something so powerful that you say, no matter what happens, I cannot deny that Jesus changed my life. You know what I think sometimes the problem we have as a church, and I know certainly I have it, the problem we have is many times we want people to behave before they believe. We want them to act a certain way, live a certain way. They should know some things. And and you know what's even more than that? We want them to believe because it's obviously true. It's so obviously true to us. Look, Jesus is real. He came and he died. So it's so obvious. So believe, you know, and, you, know, you know, behave. And these people haven't, they haven't experienced any of that. And we're trying to take what God has revealed to us and hold it against people. Why would you go there? Why would you do that? Why would you say that? Why would you be with them? Why would you live like that? Why are you back there again? And we're looking for them to behave. But the reality is they got to believe and, they, they, and not just believe because it's true or, or so obvious. Look, even James heard the teachings of Jesus and missed it. People have to have an encounter with Jesus Christ. You have to have an experience with the resurrected Savior. Where I once was Saul, but then I met Jesus, I became Paul. I once was one way, but then I met Jesus, and he's changing me. He's forgiving me. He's living through me. My anger is turning into joy. 
My lust is turning into purity. My old ways are turning into new ways. The old me is becoming brand new. Why? Because I learn more, I just read more teachings, or I listen to more podcasts, or I went to church? No, but because I had an encounter with a very real savior. He conquered the grave. He gives life to me. It's so real. It changes everything. James, James goes from a brother that's really unsure to a powerful leader in the church of Jerusalem. And, and, and what's, what's so amazing about this is, is from this moment on, we see James all the way through in the New Testament. When Peter escapes from prison and he has to go run and be on the run, he says, tell James that God delivered me because he's giving the church of Jerusalem over to James for him to become the pastor. You know, he, he was so respected that Peter, James the Greater, and John got together and they said, you are gonna be the leader of the church of Jerusalem because you have so much authority. And he was respected by all of the people. Don't you think that's amazing? He wasn't even one of the 12 apostles and yet was chosen to lead the church in Jerusalem. And he led it faithfully for 30 years. In Acts chapter 15, we see Paul, after he's had that radical life conversion, he's going and he's preaching to Gentiles, non-Jews, and they're beginning to believe in Jesus as the Savior. And then all the Jewish people begin to say, uh-uh, that's not good enough to just believe in Jesus. You now have to start behaving. You have to do this and this and this and this and this. And Paul says, I don't think that's right. Jesus gives us liberty. He gives us grace. He gives us freedom. And he gives us the Holy Spirit to convict us of what we should and shouldn't be doing. I don't need to put a list of 10,000 things you should or shouldn't be doing. I just trust that you have an encounter with Jesus, receive his spirit, and he's going to speak to you. He's going to change you. The old you is going to begin to pass, pass away. So Peter, uh, Paul presents his argument, then Peter stands up and he presents his argument, but there it is in Acts 15. The first council of the church of Jerusalem, James stands up and he says, here's my decision. And he lists out the ways that, that the, the Gentiles could come into faith of Jesus Christ. And he says, we want to make it easy on them to come into faith in Jesus Christ. Look at that. Going from believing that your brother's crazy to standing up and saying, he is God, and let's make it easy for people to come into that belief. Let's not put on unnecessary weights, but let's open the way because Jesus opened the way for us. James was faithful for 30 years as the bishop, and he was trusted by everybody. And one time around Passover, some, some Pharisees came to him, and they said, James, you're trusted by all the people. We know you're just and you're impartial. And what we're worried about is all of these other people that are beginning to go astray and believe that Jesus is the Messiah. And you know, obviously you know he's not. So, so will you go up onto the pinnacle of the temple and will you proclaim to all of the people, the Jews and the Gentiles gathered for Passover, just restrain them. We're gonna ask you if Jesus is Messiah, will you just, will you just calm everybody down? And James says, this is a good opportunity to preach the gospel. He says, I'll do it. He climbs up to the pinnacle of the temple, 400 feet above the ground, above the, the lower portion. And all of the people gather for Passover. And let me tell you, it would have been hundreds of thousands and thousands of people gathered together. And they shout to James and they say, James, is Jesus the Messiah? They ask him the way. They say, is it Je if Jesus is going to come or if the Messiah is going to return, which gate will he use? And it's just layered in prophecy. But what they're saying is, is Jesus the Messiah? And James replies, and he says, the son of man right now is seated in the right hand of God in heaven. And he rules with great power. And he will return one day in the heavenly realm on the clouds. And at that proclamation of faith, from the brother of Jesus to thousands of people, they all began to shout Hosanna to the son of David. They began to accept, yes, we agree. And the Pharisees can't believe it. They, they begin to, to, to wail amongst themselves. They said, oh, we, we have made the testimony for Jesus even worse. And, and they said, even now the just one is in error. Don't you think it's unbelievable? It's unbelievable. I, I, don't, I don't mean to get into this, but let me tell you, a, a religious spirit says everybody's wrong. Everybody's wrong. 
And here's this overly religious spirit, and they say, even the just one is in error. So Jesus is in error, and his disciples are in error, and all the prophets that came before, they killed them too. They're all in error, and now the just one, even he is in error. He's wrong, and he's lying. And so they climbed up to the pinnacle of the temple, and they grabbed James, and they threw him off 400 feet from the temple to the ground. But the Bible says uh, that the, 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 uh, the eyewitness, the Christian witness, says that when he landed, he was unharmed. Miraculously, he survived. And at that very moment, he got up and he got on his knees and he began to pray for those around him as they began to stone him to death. Praying for his persecutors. And when one of the priests heard him praying, he said, cease what you're doing. The just man prays for us. As we kill him, his righteous, the righteous one prays for us. But in that moment, one of the Levites took a club and they bashed him in the head and he murdered him on that spot. And the people became outraged at what was done. And they made a monument to James and all of the city began to turn. And people even began to question because such a just man was faithful to the end and he was murdered even though he was innocent. It began to change the whole city. The just man prays for us. And what's so powerful about this is that James proves the final words of his letter to all Christians with his death. He says, the prayer of a just person has great power and it produces much. He didn't just write these words. He lived these words. And thousands of years later, James is still speaking to us. He stands as a witness to us. Yes, he was my brother, but there was something supernatural about him. He was God in the flesh. And I've had a life-changing encounter. And with his dying breath, he declares that Jesus is who he said he is. He's the Messiah in heaven. And he will return in power and in strength. And he prays for his persecutors. And do you know what his last words were? They were the, he quoted his brother in his prayer saying, forgive them for they know not what they do. When we go through the book of James, I want you to know these are powerful words written from a powerful man. And I believe they're going to change your life over the next few weeks. I believe that they're going to change this church over the next few weeks. We're going to learn how to pray. We're going to learn how to endure trials. We're going to learn how to be consistent and be faithful. And let me tell you, we've got a great teacher, someone that was faithful to the end. And if you're here and you've never had an encounter with Jesus, let me tell you, more than words, more than church, more than, more than anything else in the world, that's what you need. You need to have an encounter with the risen Savior. And I'm telling you, after that, your whole life will be forever changed. Say, Jordan, how do you do that? You got to get to his word. He wants to speak to you. So powerful in moments like this in church, you can have a real life-changing experience. I remember I was 15 years old. I was in a worship service much like this, and I told Jesus, God, if you're real, reveal yourself to me. And I'm telling you, within 10 seconds, I don't know what they were playing. I don't remember the song. I barely remember the place. I don't remember who was speaking. I don't remember the sermon, but I felt the real, tangible, physical presence of God like I've never felt before in my life. I began to weep from my inner depths. For days, you could barely say God or Jesus around me because I would start to weep again. And let me tell you, I've gone through difficult things and different trials and tribulations, but that moment changed my life forever. And until my dying day, I'm gonna know that that was the moment where I encountered a risen savior. I will never ever be the same. The old is gone, the new has come. I'm asking you, have you had that encounter? Do you need a fresh encounter? You are in the right place, and Jesus is a worthy Savior. Will you stand to your feet right now, and, and I'm just going to pray over every single person. Will you just lift your hands? God, I pray right now over every person in this place that they encounter you, Jesus. That we receive a fresh awakening, God. God, I pray for those that have grown familiar and dry, used to your miraculous works. God, give us a fresh encounter with you. Make it real again. Restore to us the joy of our first salvation. Bring us back to our first love, God. God, I pray that we are a church that will live out the words of James, that we will endure trials, be faithful people, powerful prayers, 
God, I pray we live from the encounter. Jesus, make yourself real to us again. For all those that are in this place that have never met Jesus, I pray today is the day. Today is the day. It's not by accident that you're here. Jesus himself brought you here that he might reveal himself to you. Everything he did and everything he said was so true. 2,000 years ago, he took on that cross. He took your sin. He took your shame. He took your shortcomings. And it got buried with him in the grave. But three days later, Jesus came out as the conqueror, as the savior, as the mercy bringer. And he gives mercy, grace, forgiveness for your time of need. I pray that today you have an experience with Jesus that changes you forever. In Jesus' mighty name, not all God's people said amen.